This is a video about death. It will come for all of us one day, so it's in our best interest to figure out what will extend or shorten our lives. But in a world of false patterns and snake oil salesmen, how can we be sure something is good or bad for our life and the lives of others? That's where statistics comes in. There's an entire subfield of statistics dedicated to studying questions of death, life, and time, and it's called survival analysis. And it's one of the most important topics in biostatistics. So in this video, I'm going to teach you some basic concepts, models, and problems from survival analysis. If you're new here, my name's Christian, and this is Very Normal, a channel for making you better at statistics. The best way to do that is to understand the unique and interesting problems that statisticians face. This is one of those problems. One of the distinguishing features of survival analysis is that it deals with time data. Not just time, but time to an event. Time to event data is more complex than basic continuous data, so it's worth delving into the specifics of this type of data. To define a time to event random variable, we need three things. One, a time origin, where we start measuring time. Two, a time scale that we measure time in, like days or years. And we need to define a specific event where we stop measuring time. This event could be depth, or something like the length of a hospital stay. Time to event can either be discrete or continuous, but it can only be positive. There's no such thing as negative time in statistics. To be clear, time to event data doesn't have to be time specifically, but it's just easier to frame things in terms of time. You could also consider mileage on a car until the car's first accident as a time to event variable. But there's a reality to time to event data that other types of data don't have to deal with. Let me demonstrate. This is Carl. Carl is participating in a clinical trial to see if a new drug can extend the amount of time he'll spend in remission. He's been in the trial for two years already, and he's tired of having to come into the lab every two weeks for checkups and blood work. So one day, Carl gets up and decides, Screw you guys, I'm going home. He just leaves the trial. What Carl has done is that he's created a gap in his data. The people running the trial will never know whether or not the event happens to Carl. They say that Carl's event is <laughs> Sorry, censored. Censoring is a fundamental problem in survival analysis that we have to deal with. There are multiple types of censoring. What I've described with Carl is what's called right censoring. Carl's event may or may not happen after he leaves the trial, but we'll never know because it's to the right of him leaving. Left censoring in this case would be if someone comes into the trial already having experienced the event. In clinical trials, this is less likely to happen, but it's still a thing. There's another form of censoring called interval censoring, where we do observe the event in some interval, but we can't identify exactly when it happened within this interval. With censoring in mind, here's the type of data we might collect for a survival study. First is the amount of time we observe before they either experience the event or get censored. I'll denote this time as T. Second, we need to collect whether or not this person experiences the event. Third, we need to record whether or not this person was censored. We can also summarize it in the form of a vector. These pluses here indicate that someone was censored at this particular point. No pluses means they experienced the event. In addition to these three core variables, there may or may not be explanatory variables that we want to include to investigate the relationship with the time variable. In clinical trials, this could be a treatment, but in observational studies, this could be an environmental or a genetic factor. Now that you know a bit about time to event data, we can talk about the specific functions that statisticians use to study and characterize this type of data. With more basic types of outcomes, like blood pressure or the presence of a disease, we're often interested in characterizing the randomness in the data in a population. We usually do this with the probability distribution, like a normal or a binomial distribution. If we know the distribution of the outcome, then we'll know what values are likely or unlikely. With time to event data, we could characterize it with the probability distribution, but it's just not as useful to know what times are likely or unlikely. There are other functions that can be derived from this distribution that are useful, and we're going to talk about them here. When it comes to time, it's more natural to ask questions about intervals of time. For instance, if dying is our event of interest, we might want to know the probability of living until age 75. That is, we want to get probabilities from the cumulative distribution for the time to event data instead. This will look different depending on whether the probability distribution is discrete or continuous, but the idea is the same in either case. But even in that case, asking if we'll die before some age can feel a little… cruel. This would not be the way you'd want to hear about it at your doctor's office. Instead of asking what's the probability of living until 75, we'd prefer to know the probability of living past it. This amounts to flipping the sign to being greater than or equal to, but in terms of the cumulative distribution, we're getting this probability to the right of a given time point. 
This particular function has a special name, the survival ship or survival function. For our purposes, we'll define the survival function as the probability of surviving at a time greater than or equal to some time t. If you're looking at different sources, you might find it defined slightly differently, so just be aware. Survival functions typically have this decreasing shape because we expect more people in a sample to experience the event as time goes on. Given a long enough time horizon, the survival function will eventually go to zero. But it's also possible to see survival functions stay above zero. This is common in clinical trials where the end of the trial is decided well in advance. As with most things in statistics, the true survival function is usually unknown, so we need to estimate it from data. For now, let's pretend we live in a statistical fantasy world where there is no censoring. In this case, it's very easy to estimate the survival function. For each time point where an event happens, you just need to calculate the proportion of people who still haven't experienced the event. This particular function is called the empirical survival function, where empirical refers to the fact that it's based on observed data. Since the empirical survival function only changes when an event happens, it takes on this characteristic stair-like appearance. But of course, we don't live in this fantasy world. We have to deal with the reality of censored data. Sensor data screws up the empirical survival function because it makes it impossible to calculate the proportion at each time point. Take this example where 4 out of 10 people survive up to time 5, but one of them is censored. An event happens at day 7, but we don't know if the proportion is 4 or 3 out of 10 since we don't know what happened to the censored person at time 5. Thankfully, mathematician Edward Kaplan and statistician Paul Meyer figured out an alternative way to estimate the survival function, even in the face of censored data. Their method hinges on the idea of conditional probability to estimate the survival function. Going back to the previous data, we want to estimate the probability of surviving up to day 7 or longer. Instead of just viewing this as a single event, Kaplan and Meyer had the insight to break it down into two events. The single person in the data didn't just survive until day 7, they also survived at day 5. This single probability becomes a joint probability. Using an elementary probability identity, you can convert this joint probability into the product of a marginal probability, the probability of surviving at or past day 5, the first time point, and a conditional probability, the probability of surviving at or past day 7, given that they survived until day 5. This conditional probability actually plays a big role later in the video, but we'll get back to that. Everyone is still alive at day 5, so this first term is actually 1, leaving us to calculate this conditional probability. To calculate this conditional probability, you just need to calculate the proportion of people who experience the event among the people who are still around. This denominator will change at each time point since it's only the people who are still around at that moment. This is actually the secret sauce behind Kaplan and Meyer's method. I only care about who's still around at this particular time point. I don't care why they leave the data beforehand. You'd call these people still at risk, or the risk set. This proportion of people are the people who don't survive at day 7. Even though this death happens at day 7, by convention we have the survival function change right as the event happens, so we need to subtract it to get the actual survival probability. The next time point in the data is day 9, where someone experienced the event. This person survived not just to day 9, but both day 7 and day 5. Like before, the probability that someone survives to all three of these days can be decomposed into a product of conditional probabilities. It's almost the same thing as the calculation for day 7, but now there's a third term where we condition on all the people who survive up to day 7. All the people who died or got censored at day 5 are not included in the risk set, so it only includes the 6 people left. If we repeat this process for all the unique time values in the data, then we'll get a general formula for estimating the survival curve with censored data. This formula creates what's called the Kaplan-Meier curve, a non-parametric estimator for the survival function. Just like the empirical survival function, the Kaplan-Meier curve also has a stair-like appearance. Kaplan and Meyer developed and published this idea in 1958 in the most prestigious journal in statistics. Since then, this method has probably saved tens of thousands of lives since its invention. The paper was so impactful that it hit number 11 on the list of the most cited research papers, as shown in a 2014 paper in the journal Nature. Humans are deeply invested in knowing how long they have left to live, and the Kaplan-Meier curve is one of the most widely used tools for figuring this out. To understand a second tool, we need to look back at the specific form of the Kaplan-Meier estimate. I mentioned that this particular conditional probability is important, and now it's time to cover it. The survival function tells us the probability of surviving past some time point, aka the probability of not experiencing the event. That's useful in some contexts, but there are other times where we're interested in studying the event itself. 
But when it comes to time to event data, it's not as simple as looking at the probability distribution. Like I mentioned earlier, to experience an event up to some time t, we also need to not experience it up to that time as well. It's usually more appropriate to talk in terms of conditional probability here. This idea is so important that statisticians have given its own name, hazard. I'll denote hazard as lambda and show you how it's defined in math terms. It's a lot to take in, so I'll break it down slowly. For some small change in time, delta t, the hazard at time t is the probability that the event will happen within this small period of time, given that this person has survived up until this point. This limit here indicates that the interval should approach zero. So you can think of hazard as the probability of experiencing the event in the very next instant of time, kind of like instantaneous failure rate, akin to how the derivative is an instantaneous slope for a given function. If you know what the hazard is for all points in time, then you have what's called the hazard function. One of the advantages of the hazard function is that the shape alone can tell us a lot about the probability of the event over time. For example, let's say that the event is breaking a bone from falling, and that our time range is a typical human life. When we're younger, it's very unlikely that we'll break a bone just from living life. But as we get older, our bodies and skeletons become more frail. At an old enough age, bones will easily break from a simple fall. This results in an increasing hazard function. Hazard can also decrease over time as well. Evidence has shown that most miscarriages happen in the first trimester due to a variety of reasons. But past the first trimester, the probability of a miscarriage gets smaller and smaller, resulting in this decreasing shape. So what do we do with the hazard function in survival analysis? As it turns out, the hazard function plays a key role in examining if explanatory variables change the probability that an event will happen. If this is the hazard function of someone on placebo, and this is the hazard function of that same person but on treatment, you can see that your hazard is lower for a given time. This is what we'd hope to see. Conversely, we'd also want to avoid any risk factors that increase our hazard, since this increases our chance of the event happening. But in this light, we're not really interested in the hazard function itself. We're more so interested in how other variables change the function. This is the idea behind another one of the most important models in statistics, the proportional hazards model. The proportional hazards model was first introduced in a 1972 paper in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society. The model has been so impactful on biomedical research that Sir David Cox, the inventor of the model, was awarded the first Nobel Prize in statistics. And it was also added on Nature's List of Most Cited Papers, coming in at number 24. The proportional hazards model gets its name from the model structure. Covariates create a multiplicative change on the hazard function. This hazard function here is sometimes denoted as having a not next to it to denote that it's the baseline hazard function, the hazard you would get if all the covariates are equal to zero. For example, being in the placebo group. When the parameter beta is negative, this causes the exponential expression to be less than one, meaning that the variable reduces hazard. Conversely, a positive beta would produce a factor greater than one, meaning that this variable is associated with increased hazard. Some implementation of Cox's model have a negative sign in the exponential, so the parameter interpretations would be reversed in this case. As with many statistical models, this particular model assumes that the hazard functions change proportionally. If we have what's called crossing hazards, then that's a huge violation of this model's assumptions, and a different one should be used. Another way to view the parameter is in terms of a ratio. If someone is on treatment, then the hazard function on the left will be conditioned on this variable. If we move over the baseline hazard function, we'll see that this expression represents a ratio of hazard functions, or hazard ratio for short. The proportional hazards model is special in that it contains both a parametric bit, contained in the exponential, and the non-parametric bit, contained in the hazard function. Non-parametric in this case refers to something infinite dimensional, like this function. This combination means that the model is what's called a semi-parametric model. Cox uses what's called a partial likelihood to avoid needing to estimate anything about the hazard function. With this partial likelihood, we can use techniques like maximum likelihood estimation to get the parameter values. Even though this model is relatively simple to understand, the underlying statistical mechanisms supporting the model are intricate and worth talking about themselves. The Kaplan-Meier curve and the proportional hazards model are two of the fundamental models used in survival analysis. They allow us to study time-to-event data, which is core to our ability to extend the lives of the people who need it. If you found this video useful, I hope that I've earned a like and subscribe from you. I try to make statistics videos every two weeks, but in pursuit of my 2025 goal, I'm going to try to upload weekly for a bit. Emphasis on try. If you'd like to hear about videos as soon as they come out, you can also subscribe to the channel newsletter. You'll get videos sent straight to your inbox, and you can learn a little bit more about what's going on with me behind the scenes. 
that's it for this one. I'll see you in the next one. Themselves.